Good evening, friends. Uh, today's uh, webcast is by Dr. Neil Mehta. I am Kapoor, and I'll just uh, shortly introduce Dr. Neil Mehta. He is the Assistant Dean of Education, Informatics and Technology at Cleveland Clinic, USA, Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University, Professor of Medicine, uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western uh, Reserve University. He is the Director of Center of Technology for Technology, Enhanced Knowledge and Instruction, CTEKI at Cleveland Clinic, and uh, so many other uh, achievements to his name. Uh, he is a, um, a well known uh, speaker, uh, researcher and an author of so many uh, articles and books and uh, he is a very uh, you know appropriate person apt person to speak on this topic which is uh, you may call it offbeat but then very relevant to the field of medicine okay and uh, he'll be uh, you know joined in a way that you know by two of us uh, myself dr vipul kapoor uh, i'm a consultant interventional cardiologist at uh, sims hospital ahmedabad Mm, um, uh, right, and I believe uh, you would have attended my session as well. So I'm not going to too much of details. And uh, along with me, the panelist, uh, second panelist, would be Dr. Keur Parikh. Mm, he is also with the Sims Hospital. He is the chairman uh, and the uh, MD uh, of uh, the organization. Uh, senior interventional cardiologist, renowned cardiologist, with so many attributes to his name. And um, without wasting much time, I think we'll go on with the session. And uh, we'll start with the first lecture uh, by Dr. Neil Mehta, right? And uh, he'll be uh, taking two topics today. And I think we can start with the first one. It's meditation where you are learning to focus on one thing, which is means you're controlling your attention, which is important for everything I just said. Now, moving to the last part, does this work? Right? And we look at fantastic research trials on statins and uh, angioplasties. Do we have that kind of data? Unfortunately not. There are many types of meditation, so difficult to compare. Very difficult to do randomized controlled trials that are blinded. You can't really blind people about what they are doing. So usually these are short-term studies that are not powered to show differences. But there is a lot of data. And what I'm going to look at, show you, are the very best pieces of data that I can find that you can hang your hat on. So this is a huge meta-analysis that was published in JAMA, 18,000 citations that boiled down to 47 trials that actually were uh, randomized with an active control. And they looked at anxiety, depression, and ability to perceive pain. I'll just show this fantastic graphic. People on the, uh, just look here on the left side. So people who did meditation are here and you can see for almost everything, people who meditate do better for anxiety, for depression, for pain perception, for positive effect. And uh, for almost everything else, it almost reaches significance. So clearly for mental health, there's no doubt it makes the most sense. Why does this work? People who meditate, they actually, and this was testing many different meditation techniques, they actually change their EEGs. Their gamma, ray, gamma wave activity goes up, it's higher amplitude, and this stays high even when they are not meditating. So if you have been meditating for many years, even sitting in a room like this, your gamma waves activity will be higher and that correlates with the ability to pay attention and consciousness. And the people who are more experienced have better uh, gamma waves. This is a trade effect that lasts for many, many long time, even after you stop meditating. So it changes your brain. If you do MRI and functional MRI studies on people who are meditating, there are eight specific areas of the brain that the gray and the white matter actually changes. You know, we went through med school thinking the brain cannot change once you're five. The brain changes forever. You can completely change these parts of your brain. The, there's difficulty in measuring the change, so it's a medium effect. But again, the difficulty is the number of different types of meditation people are doing. People who meditate longer for many years have more changes. So clearly, the brain can change. Telomeres 
correlate with survival. If your telomeres are longer, you live longer. If you meditate, your telomeres actually get longer. Nine out of 11 studies have shown that people who meditate have longer telomeres. And finally, we are talking about cardiology here, right? So let me share with you, we learn about residual risk. You can get your LDL down to 10, right? If it's up to K or it would be zero. So you can get it down to zero. Does that mean you'll never have a heart attack? You still will, right? You still can. There is a residual risk even after you do everything you can. So let's look at transcendental meditation, which is a mantra-based meditation and maze. So they had people for secondary prevention. These were people who already had had heart attacks. They were randomized to do DM or get just regular health education. The transcendental meditation intervention was 20 minutes twice a day, 40 minutes a day. I know it's a lot, but on the other hand, that's your life. You can look at the profile. Only 60% were on statins, which kind of blew me away. These were secondary prevention studies. 50% on ACEs. BMI was high and a lot of people were smoking. So yes, you could change their lifestyle and medication better. But the outcome studies, there was a 48% reduction in the primary outcome over five years. Mean follow-up of five years. People who do transcendental meditation, 20 minutes twice a day, 48% decreased risk of the primary outcome. Which medication does that? So think about that and think about the power of this. So I'm going to end here by the take-home message. It's very, very important to train your brain to be able to pay attention to the present moment. Remember, that is the only moment you have to do anything. Stop worrying about the past. Stop worrying about the future. Live in the moment. How do you do that? By training your brain to pay attention to now. And learn to control your thoughts and your emotions. And it's easier said than done. You need to practice this. Just like Tendulkar probably practiced for hours and hours and hours before he could get that cover drive. Or Virat Kohli, if that's your fit. I'm just aging myself. But it takes a while to become good at anything. And you can't read about this and start meditating. You have to practice to do it. There are many, many, many sites that will help you do it. The one I use to get into this, uh, you can Google this. Look for mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, uh, mindfulness. It's from the University of Massachusetts, where most a lot of research has been done. It has a free eight-week course guides you stepwise with podcasts and reading for eight weeks, and then gives you a certificate if you want completely free. So uh, I'm going to stop there. If we have time, we can open it up for questions, but I encourage you to try this out. I do it with my friends and family on weekends, and it is pretty amazing. The feedback that you give to yourself and the calmness you get, it's incredibly therapeutic. So thank you for listening and take care. So changing tracks a little bit, we're going to talk about some things that are coming down the pike in the future. And I believe this will be coming to India pretty soon. And so hoping to make you aware of this. You know, as you look at the slide here, you usually when you think about physicians, you think about three iconic things, the white coat, the stethoscope, and the black bag. And I think the black bag is gone. I don't know how many of you still carry a black bag around. No one does. Uh, at least in the U.S., we all wear a lab coat when we see patients. But the question today is, will we lose the stethoscope that we carry around our uh, necks everywhere? I have no conflict of interest, and this is important because I will be talking about a, at least showing images of a few products, and I have no connection with any of those companies. So what will we talk about? So firstly, yes, some improvements in technology of the stethoscope. Secondly, we'll look at how good are we really at using the stethoscope? We've been using it for years. Do we know what we are doing? And then if we add a small handheld device that is an ultrasound, does it make us better? 
And if it does, should we start using it and training our students in med schools and some practical consideration? So a uh, question for you. Uh, this is the question slide. So which of these statements do you agree with? The ultrasound is difficult to learn. Ultrasound machines are too expensive and too inconvenient. It cannot replace the stethoscope. A, B, all three, or none of them. Okay, and I like to ask questions where I see a good spread, and uh, I'll let you answer the question yourself uh, in a couple minutes. Uh, so, it, very interestingly, and this is 2020, but when I made this slide, it was a, almost exactly 200 years since the stethoscope was first, uh, uh, you know, invented by Lanik. And JAMA came out with a republication of its 100th year anniversary paper on the stethoscope. Now, since more recently, there have been additional things. So right here, you see this little uh, device that has been added to a regular stethoscope. So you could take your stethoscope, put this device in between, and connect it via Bluetooth to your smartphone, and you would see the sound waves of the person. This is available for roughly, I think, about $200 in the US and basically you don't need even to be a physician to buy it, I believe. So just something to think about. And now the company has just come out with this device, which in addition to getting the sound waves is also a digital stethoscope with that captures the uh, EKG waveform. So with you just put it on the chest, you can hear the heartbeat, you can see it on and record it on your phone, iPad or Android and also see the EKG waveform all in one. So this is already available. The question is, what do these devices do? So it's hard to see the scale of this, but imagine this is your regular smartphone. This is a device called Butterfly IQ, and this is another uh, device from GE called WeScan. And both these are pretty small handheld devices, and there are a few others on the market. So this came out, I think 2018 was when it became available. I don't think on the website you can still purchase it from India, but I'm sure you know people in the US or UK or Australia, you can get it purchased. The cost is $2,000. These other things in the past used to cost nine to $10,000. So five years ago, this was in the NEJM that we should probably stop listening and start looking using an ultrasound. And let's talk about why this might be true. So another question, this is an audience response question. So which of the following uh, are you most comfortable with when you're using a stethoscope? Can you distinguish innocent from a significant murmurs? S3, detecting the consolidation signs with an, in a pneumonia? A and C, all of them or none of them? Question. Okay, so we are comfortable with all of them. I'm super impressed. Now, in general, I train here and I'll tell you the uh, most people, most physicians in the U.S. also believe that because of the way we trained, we with the volume of patients, uh, there is at least this impression that physicians trained in India are very good at physical diagnosis. The data I'm going to show is not from India, but let's take a look. So this is from the Rational Clinical Diagnosis Series in JAMA, which really was a fantastic series of articles looking at common physical diagnosis. Uh, techniques and do they work and how good are they at predicting anything. So uh, focus here on the ability for of cardiologists to agree on cardiac murmurs. Point three, the inter-rater reliability. This is from uh, 20 years ago, but still. And with murmurs that were more than grade one, it was about the same. 
So cardiologists using stethoscopes don't have very good agreement on what they are hearing as far as systolic murmurs go. What about S3? That tends to vary a little bit with the level of training. So at the top are fellows who actually do better than cardiology attendings. So fellows have a slightly better agreement with a phonocardiogram, uh, when, whether they are actually listening to an S3 or not and detecting it. Residents and interns do very poorly. The, even if you hear an S3, the problem is it's not very sensitive for predicting actual clinical heart failure. It's very specific. So if you hear an S3 and you know what you're doing, it is specific. But if you depend on that to detect heart failure, you're probably going to miss a lot. How about lungs then? So we talked about the heart. So longest slide, 250 odd patients in the emergency room, and they let the people do a history and listen to the chest with the stethoscope and compared it to the final diagnosis after all the diagnostic testing was done. And these were the final di common uh, presentations of chest symptoms. History alone, as we all know, got you mo almost all the way there. Usually we say that history plus physical exam for unknown cases, roughly 70 to 80 percent of cases you will get right. You may do additional testing, but you know what's going on. In this case, in the ED, and maybe this is a commentary on ED physicians and not us, the lung auscultation added almost nothing to the history. So they didn't do a very good job. Uh, okay, so traditional exam doesn't help too much. How about when you use a handheld ultrasound? And we saw those two devices right there. So this is a group of patients who were referred for a traditional transthoracic echo for the common causes, you know, shortness of breath, chest pain, arrhythmia, um, people with stroke to look for a PE or people with a murmur to look for valvular heart disease. And they had, after the echo was done, they got some cardiologists and what cardiologists would do the exam uh, uh, with the handheld ultrasound. Okay. And they weren't allowed to take a history. And the other cardiologists would just do a physical exam traditionally. So you're looking at cardiologists who don't know the answer, comparing handheld with a stethoscope. And right here, these are experienced cardiologists. None of them could beat the cardiologists who use the handheld ultrasound. So clearly, when cardiologists who generally have some training in echocardiograph use a handheld ultrasound, they do better than if they don't. And those are the p-values. So let's take a look at people who are not really trained in echoes. And this is a group of internal medicine residents with one hour of training, one hour of training using a handheld ultrasound. They had 10 patients, 12 carotids, eight of them had no plaques and 12 had some plaques in the carotid. One hour training, and in a five minute exam, they all did better than chance. Some of them did almost as well as trained ultrasonographers at picking up plaques in the carotid, one hour of training. Uh, since then, this has been, uh, ultrasound right now in the US is used by ED physicians a lot. They assess the intravascular volume status used by measuring the IVC and how much it varies with uh, respiration. Um, Obviously, it's used for vascular access. It is the standard of care for central line procedures. And it's used to uh, tap pleural fluids. So it's become pretty widely available, but used to be very big machines. You'd have to wait for the machine, reserve it. It would be wheeled into the room, and then you would do it. Now you can carry the device in your bucket, just whip it out, just like a stethoscope, and use it. So the big question is then, what about students? If this is the future, can we train students and will they be able to use it? So here they had students who actually got decent training, 18 hours of training using the handheld ultrasound device. And they had 61 patients with about 240 different clinical findings on the uh, cardiac uh, exam. They gave the students the handheld ultrasound and they gave the cardiologists no handheld ultrasound. So we here we have experienced cardiologists doing what they normally do and students who really don't know what they were doing except they had 18 hours of training. 
in every parameter, the students were more accurate at picking up cardiac findings after 18 hours of training than cardiologists, I'm sorry guys, with many, many years of training, okay? So, <laughs> so now uh, this was a paper that came out in the Green Journal. Everyone is starting to think, should we actually start carrying uh, ultrasound instead of a stethoscope? And uh, already medical schools are doing this. Mount Sinai, they gave pocket ultrasound devices to their class of 2016. University of Connecticut, which is where the butterfly IQ was uh, developed last year, uh, two years ago, uh, started using it in the med school. And UC Davis, this year in the summer, the new class, when they get a white coat is a very important ceremony when you first would get a white coat as a new medical student. Everyone, instead of a stethoscope, got a pocket ultrasound device. So this is where things are going in the US. So the question is, what are some next steps and are we there yet? So yes, I have one of, I have the butterfly IQ because it was so cheap and I was curious, I just got it. Uh, I'm still learning how to use it. It is a little bit heavier, but I'll tell you it's about this slightly smaller than my iPhone in size, but it's a little bit heavier. And the benefit is I'm already carrying my phone. So I just have to carry that device. I don't have to carry additional transducers. I don't have to carry anything else, just that one thing. It loses charge about two, three days. And so I have to, it's a wireless charger. I just put it in my office and it gets charged again. But it could be a little more uh, lighter. The thing I don't, can't do with that is listen to the lungs. I can see the images, nor can I listen to bowel sounds. Now, I don't really care too much about bowel sounds. I don't think they help too much, but listening to the lungs for me is pretty important. Um, the other problem is our faculty are not trained in this. So if our students start coming with this to this office, our faculty don't know what the heck to do with this. So we are actually first training all our faculty on using this. So when the students come to the clinics and to the wards with an ultrasound device, they don't get the hidden curriculum that this is not useful. No one uses it anymore. Uh, if I use this and I'm trained, can I bill for this? And what are the medical legal issues now for an internist doing an ultrasound? If I miss something in this medical legal environment, should I just focus on using it this for education or should I start using it for clinical use? And uh, finally, the concern is students have so many things to learn. They still are learning how to talk to patients and take a history. Now you're adding a layer of technology in between where they now start whipping out the, the ultrasound and start taking ultrasound images. Do we have time to cover the basics of what they need to know and the ultrasound in the curriculum? And finally, I showed you the devices which record the heart sounds and even generate an EKG from there. What about those devices? Can we compare those with the handheld ultrasound and see how much it helps versus the regular stethoscope? So uh, my own feeling is that as the devices keep getting more powerful and smaller, this is going to be standard of care pretty soon. And so if you get a chance to get hold of one of these devices and can spare some loose change, go for it. So the talk today is kind of very different from what I usually speak about. Usually I speak about things that are coming down the pike in the future of medicine. And this is a different take on this. It's about mindfulness. And what are we going to talk about? First of all, obviously there is no product here and I have no conflict of interest. What I want to cover in the next uh, 20 odd minutes, first, a little bit about how the brain works. And don't worry, I'm not going into deep into anatomy, but you are physicians and you need to know the scientific basis for meditation and mindfulness. Once we do that, we'll talk a little bit about the types of meditation that are there and how they play a critical role in improving <coughs> attention. So this is the key issue facing all of us. Our attention spans are so short, we cannot sit for two minutes before looking at WhatsApp. And our attention spans are getting worse. And so 
the point that we are going to make is if you can control your attention, that is what mindfulness trains you to do. And then finally, what is the point of all this? Does this have applications in real life and in medicine? And we'll take a look at some of the evidence. So first part about the brain. So if you think about the brain, uh, evolutionary uh, basis, there is the very, very old brain, which is the brainstem. And this is the brain that even reptiles have. And that is the brainstem, the cerebellum. And what is the function? Even without thinking, you are breathing and your heart is beating and you are walking and you are balanced. That is automatic and that is every living creature literally has this. After that came what is called the limbic system. And this is the amygdala and the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. And this is what is responsible for emotions and memories. So all of you know Pavlov's dog, right? You ring a bell, you give food, and the dog sees the food and starts salivating. After a while, you ring the bell and the dog starts salivating. What is happening? The memory of the bell and the food are linked and the emotion of happiness at seeing food is linked. And this is happening at the limbic system level. Again, this is a reflex, it's automatic. The key difference that humans have is we have something that is called the neocortex. And we'll talk very briefly about this. And the neocortex is what makes us different. It allows us to control our attention, our consciousness. It gives us language and it gives us thought and imagination. So if you think about the brain, which is right here, that controls the limbic system and if you can get control over your neocortex, you can control the limbic system, which is your memories, your thoughts, and your emotions. And that is what we're going to talk about. So I said I'd talk a little bit about evolution. And if you look at how our brains have evolved over time, looking at our predecessors, this line here shows how flat this portion of the skull was, which means the frontal lobes were not very well developed. And as you can see, the slope of the line increasingly becomes vertical. And if you start looking at each other, most of us have pretty vertical uh, foreheads. And that is where our prefrontal cortex is. So the prefrontal cortex, which is right here, controls your limbic system if you allow it to and train it to. And hold this thought because that will come back to this thought in a minute. But remember the anatomy of why we as humans are different. Now we're going to switch our attention to attention. So I already made the point that attention is scarce. This point was made many, many years ago by George Miller. And what he found was that we can remember at the most seven discrete pieces of data at any one time. So I'll give you an example. This is a phone number. And if I rattle it off, you won't remember it, but you will keep repeating it to yourself in your mind. And you will keep saying 216-223-2273. And if someone says something in between, you'll forget this number. That's because it's more than seven. So what do we end up doing? We make it something that we can remember. And now you can remember this number. So this is what the Cleveland Clinic does, is it picks a number that you can make into words so people can remember it. So our limitation of attention is so much that if you are listening to me right now and looking at me in the slides, that completely consumes your attention span. If at that time you look at a phone, someone says something, there's a loud noise, the temperature in the room changes, you will not be able to focus on what I'm saying. So that is the limit of our attention. And can we manage to control this? That is what mindfulness is all about. So that slide that I'm going to show next, let me explain that. This is to make the point that our attention is very limited. So what this slide is going to do is it's, it'll have one image. And within a split second, it'll change to a slightly different image. And you are going to look at the slide and try and tell me, raise your hand as soon as you see the difference between the two, okay? And then we'll see how easy or difficult that is, all right? So if you see a difference between these two images, 
Raise your hand. Don't shout it out. And I guarantee it's not going to be easy. Okay? No one yet. To make it easier, I'll put a rectangle. It's within this rectangle. Okay, one person. Two. And to make it even easier, I'll make it the rectangle smaller. And now you'll start seeing it. Okay? So the point here is, this image was always there. You could not see it because you were paying attention to the rabbit in the middle or something else. So unless you pay attention to what you are supposed to, you never notice it. And if you don't notice it, you cannot compare it with the next image which has changed. So that is, even though this image is hitting your retina, your brain is not registering because your limit of attention is only to a few pixels on that screen, okay? So hold that thought now. So we talked about the brain, how it controls attention. We talked about how attention is very limited. So let's get philosophical. What is the difference between the dreaming state and the conscious state, okay? So when you are sleeping and you're dreaming, you see stuff. You see stuff in color. You hear stuff or you imagine you hear stuff. You feel emotions. And the same thing happens when you are awake. So what is the difference between these two states? Anyone? And again, this is, yeah. Okay. So that's a, yes. So great point is everyone is experiencing something shared in the same room. In dreams, you are doing it alone. You're seeing what you're seeing. The second key difference is, theoretically, you can control what you pay attention to when you are conscious. So you can be looking at this image or you can be looking at your phone. It doesn't matter. But that is the reality that you create in the presence of a shared reality. And that ability to focus on what you want to is consciousness, right? So now let's take a journey. So this is a very famous uh, Disney ride. Imagine that this is your journey through life. And let's, it's very short video. Let's take a look. you get the idea. You're sitting in a boat going down a path and you see lots of things. Now some of you were able to look at the magic carpet. Someone saw a drummer on the side and someone saw a Taj Mahal like building with a row of people in front. It's hard to focus on everything. What happens in life even now is everything you experience a split second later, your brain plays an audio and a video of that in your mind. And whatever you paid attention to is what plays on that video. So you may be looking at someone sitting there instead of me. And that is what you're going to remember, right? So you can go through life looking at the good things and you would come away from that same experience and say, that was awesome, I'm so happy. And the next person could look, go through life looking at all the negative things and say, life sucks. It's the same shared experience, like he said, but it's what you make of it. So the whole point of this talk is, how can you learn to pay attention to what is important and make your life what it needs to be? So another concept I want to talk about, and I... Uh, it's a, a story about my dad. So he was in U.S. He heard about a very close family member who died at, at a very young age while my dad was in U.S. That night, my dad got admitted for an MI at the U.S. hospital. 
So what do you think the diagnosis was? So his cat was normal, but he had all the EKG changes. So he had Takatsubo, he had a broken heart syndrome. And what happens is when we are faced with strong emotions, we have this surge of catecholamines that can completely stun your heart. Chronically, if your catecholamine levels are high and they're not blocked, you get heart failure. So you can see clearly that the catecholamines play a big role in our life. The amygdala is what generates your reaction to events in life. So if you're driving and someone cuts in front of you and you get upset, and you know, depending on vocabulary, you say certain choice words, right? Now, at that point, you are hurting yourself, not the other person. Your heart rate, your blood pressure are up. You may even get a heart attack depending on how angry you are, right? So that is called an amygdala hijack, and it's the amygdala controlling your catecholamines doing this. But if you can control your emotions and thoughts, the prefrontal cortex <laughs> gives you the ability to completely change how you react to these events. And that is a training is called mindfulness. The last point theoretically I want to make is we have only now, right? All our life, we can either think about the future and worry about it, or we can worry about the past and what happened. The only time you can do anything is now. And if you want to focus on making things better for yourself, you need to be able to focus on the now. So again, the point is, can you learn to pay attention to the now so you can make a difference and control your life? Now, how do you do this? Right? Some of us could go to the Himalayas and spend 500 years there. Some people go into the woods and uh, live there for a long time, but you don't have to. There are many, many, many types of meditation, and I don't have time to go into that. But the key differences are some meditations require you to be sitting absolutely still in the same place for a while, and others involve physical activity like Tai Chi. Some are very open-ended, meaning you just sit there and look at your thoughts. The others require you to focus on your breathing or on a mantra like Om or whatever your, the mantra may be, but something that you focus on very specifically. Regardless, it's meditation where you are learning to focus on one thing, which is, means you're controlling your attention, which is important for everything I just said. Now moving to the last part. Does this work, right? And we look at fantastic research trials on statins and uh, angioplasties. Do we have that kind of data? Unfortunately not. There are many types of meditation, so difficult to compare. Very difficult to do randomized controlled trials that are blinded. You can't really blind people about what they are doing. So usually these are short-term studies that are not powered to show differences, but there is a lot of data. And what I'm going to look at, show you, are the very best pieces of data that I can find that you can hang your hat on. So this is a huge meta-analysis that was published in JAMA, 18,000 citations that boiled down to 47 trials that actually were uh, randomized with an active control. And they looked at anxiety, depression, and ability to perceive pain. I'll just show this fantastic graphic. People on the, uh, just look here on the left side. So people who did meditation are here and you can see for almost everything, people who meditate do better for anxiety, for depression, for pain perception, for positive effect, and uh, for almost everything else, it almost reaches significance. So clearly for mental health, there's no doubt it makes the most sense. Why does this work? People who meditate, they actually, and this was testing many different meditation techniques, they actually change their EEGs. Their gamma, ray, gamma wave activity goes up, it's higher amplitude, and this stays high even when 
they are not meditating. So if you have been meditating for many years, even sitting in a room like this, your gamma waves activity will be higher. And that correlates with the ability to pay attention and consciousness. And the people who are more experienced have better uh, gamma waves. This is a trait effect that lasts for many, many long time, even after you stop meditating. So it changes your brain. If you do MRI and functional MRI studies on people who are meditating, there are eight specific areas of the brain that the gray and the white matter actually changes. You know, we went through med school thinking the brain cannot change once you're five. The brain changes forever. You can completely change these parts of your brain. The, there's difficulty in measuring the change, so it's a medium effect. But again, the difficulty is the number of different types of meditation people are doing. People who meditate longer for many years have more changes. So clearly, the brain can change. Telomeres correlate with survival. If your telomeres are longer, you live longer. If you meditate, your telomeres actually get longer. Nine out of 11 studies have shown that people who meditate have longer telomeres. And finally, we are talking about cardiology here, right? So let me share with you, we learn about residual risk. You can get your LDL down to 10, right? If it's up to K or it would be zero. So you can get it down to zero. Does that mean you'll never have a heart attack? You still will, right? You still can. There is a residual risk even after you do everything you can. So let's look at transcendental meditation, which is a mantra-based meditation and maze. So they had people for secondary prevention. These were people who already had had heart attacks. They were randomized to do DM or get just regular health education. The transcendental meditation intervention was 20 minutes twice a day, 40 minutes a day. I know it's a lot, but on the other hand, that's your life. You can look at the profile. Only 60% were on statins, which kind of blew me away. These were secondary prevention studies. 50% on ACEs. BMI was high and a lot of people were smoking. So yes, you could change their lifestyle and medication better. But the outcome studies there was a 48% reduction in the primary outcome over five years. Mean follow-up of five years. People who do transcendental meditation, 20 minutes twice a day, 48% decreased risk of the primary outcome. Which medication does that? So think about that and think about the power of this. So I'm going to end here by the take-home message. It's very, very important to train your brain to be able to pay attention to the present moment. Remember, that is the only moment you have to do anything. Stop worrying about the past. Stop worrying about the future. Live in the moment. How do you do that? By training your brain to pay attention to now. And learn to control your thoughts and your emotions. And it's easier said than done. You need to practice this, just like Tendulkar probably practiced for hours and hours and hours before he could get that cover drive. Or Virat Kohli, if that's your fit. I'm just aging myself. But it takes a while to become good at anything. And you can't read about this and start meditating. You have to practice to do it. There are many, many, many sites that will help you do it. The one I use to get into this, uh, you can Google this. Look for mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR. Uh, mindfulness. It's from the University of Massachusetts, where most a lot of research has been done. It has a free eight-week course, guides you stepwise with podcasts and reading for eight weeks, and then gives you a certificate if you want completely free. So uh, I'm going to stop there. If we have time, we can open it up for questions. But I encourage you to try this out. I do it with my friends and family on weekends, and it is pretty amazing. The feedback that you give to yourself and the calmness you get, it's incredibly therapeutic. So thank you for listening and take care. Good evening, everybody. Yes, good evening. I'm Dr. Teo Parekh. Good. We have quite a few questions lined up. And uh, I'll start with a couple of questions and answer and then throw the question to you. 
Uh, yes. One question is, can you provide a live demonstration of point of care ultrasound? The best place would be Google, right? Point of care ultrasound or even POCUS, P-O-C-U-S, and then go to videos and there are quite a few videos there. And it will explain to you in detail. The next question is, what are the reasons for decreased sensitivity and specificity in current method of auscultation? Why don't you answer that, Dr. Vipul? That why is auscultation not great as great? And what are the limitations? Which already Dr. Uh, Neil Mehta explained, but you can again revise very briefly because we have about 15 to 20 questions. Right. Yeah, uh, as Dr. Neil mentioned in his lecture, I believe it is just, uh, uh, you know, it is part of our training, you know, uh, with the present uh, scenario and all the way we are trained and with the complexities of the clinical science, most of us actually train to pass exams, to be very frank. And at the same time, you know, these signs are not very easy to differentiate, right, uh, with clinical uh, confounding factors uh, and the way that we are trained in our training institutes and our medical schools. I believe, uh, you know, all of these signs do have limitations and I believe that would be the major factor for the decreased sensitivity and specificity. And with the recent availability of, uh, you know, uh, ultrasound machines and echo machines uh, at hand, at, at least in the private institutes, I believe uh, your reliance on the stethoscopes and your physical and clinical examination would obviously go down once they are easily available. And I believe that is now reflecting in the way we practice clinically as well in our day-to-day -day life. The next question is, and you may be the right person, who should ideally perform 2D echo, radiologist or treating cardiologist? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, it's uh, it's pretty simple as a, as far as a cardiologist is concerned. See, we as cardiologists are groomed, uh, you know, uh, or we are bred, uh, you know, thoroughly on uh, echocardiography. But at the same time, what advantage we have vis-a-vis -a, -vis a radiologist is that we do have the clinical insight into that particular patient, which radiologists, you know, as uh, as back end as the branches. Right, they do have the knowledge, theoretical knowledge, but uh, still the clinical insight into that particular particular patient is definitely lacking. And I believe that uh, plays a big role, uh, you know, as far as uh, making a clinical diagnosis on an echo is concerned. And at the same time, we are totally unbiased as far as echo findings are concerned. And we look at the echocardiography, uh, you know, as thoroughly, uh, you know, and as unbiased as we can. So we look at new findings and apart from that, we don't get fixated onto one, to, on one diagnosis. And that, that is why possibly I believe that radiologists would be, mm, you know, uh, would not be as good as uh, cardiologists uh, on doing a 2D echo. Just like we would not be as good as, you know, possibly reading a CT scan. So, you know, it, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, the next question is an interesting one. Can I use focus without touching the patient? And uh, not as far as I know, I know with the COVID scenario, uh, these kind of questions will uh, have to come. But I do not believe maybe in future technology. The question next one, which is a question, but I can tell you the answer is not what you may expect. Why is carotid and large blood vessels not a part of routine ultrasound study of heart? In fact, they are. And you can elaborate on it, Vipul. Yes. Yeah, I believe uh, nowadays, uh, because now carotid intima, intima media thickness is now is a very important, uh, you know, uh, risk marker, risk factor for predicting future cardiovascular events. And so uh, we as cardiologists per se are also getting trained into using those linear probes to looking just it is just a small uh, one minute extension of routine doing your routine echocardiography. And you can definitely, uh, you know, get a lot of whole lot of information in, you know, possible those intermediate risk uh, patients who, you know, come to you on your OPD for health checkups and you and they possibly ask you whether I require a statin therapy or what risk do I have as far as future ASCVD events are concerned. So I believe, um, uh, you know, carotids and large blood vessels, uh, you know, like your femorals or your brachials for that matter, uh, should become a part of the future uh, ultrasound studies. And in any case, they are now beginning to become a part. So I believe it is not too far a uh, stretch of imagination. It's a very good question. And the answer is yes. It, 
it should be almost a mandatory part of cardiac workup where specifically you are looking for atherosclerotic heart disease. It may not be a part in a young patient or a valvular patient, but once you reach the middle age or 40, 50 plus, then you are doing echocardiogram in either ischemic patient, ACS patient, MI patient, CAD patient, then you should almost always, and there are people who believe that femoral artery in tibia media thickness even is a better predictor, though we do not do that. Partly it's not in the habit and partly patients' compliance to get it done is very low. The next question is, how is the point of care ultrasound superior to radiological finding? That I can tell you. Studies in USA internationally have shown that the sensitivity specificity of point of care ultrasound is superior to radiologic findings. So it's plain and simple that finding disease and excluding disease both is superior with point of care ultrasound. Next question is, is butterfly IQ available in India? Not as far as I know, but I can tell you, uh, we scan by G and Philips has another point of care ultrasound, I forget the name. We just purchased the first one of its kind in India uh, just last month. I don't even know if it's delivered, we pull. A very yeah, old, yeah, that reminds, we'll have to check it. But they will be coming into India. However, the next question is correlated that even if it comes in India, because it is an ultrasound, you'll have to get the license, government license, not to use it in prenatal, in uh, pregnant women, and be very specific that it will not be portable outside your place of work. All ultrasound in India, as far as I know, are controlled to be used only in the place of work designated to the operator. Am I right, Dr. Vipul? Yes, sir. Yes, exactly. So that will be the key barrier to implementing point of care ultrasound in India. Uh, next question you can answer. Now doctors are not doing practice on auscultation. <laughs> they are relying more on investigation, your views on that. So that will be a combination of what Neil Mehta mentioned. Neil. And you can add on to the investigations relative and probably biased but definite absolute superiority than ultra uh, auscultation go ahead yeah uh, so as dr neil said see it is both uh, academic uh, as well as at the same time uh, you know financial uh, issues involved but at the same what we would focus on possibly is academic because as neil said uh, you know uh, even with the best of hands with the best of cardiologists you know best clinical cardiologists with age obviously with your experience and all you tend to pick up findings but then you also tend to miss quite a few and if in the best of hands uh, when you look at the same parameter say an s3 right uh, at the, in the best of hands it, the sensitivity was you know you were only good as at about say 60 percent right when you look at the ultrasound right to pick up uh, you know uh, heart failure incident heart failure incipient heart failure right the sensitivity went up to almost 90 percent even almost 96 to 98 percent so, you know, that is just one parameter. But when you look at so many parameters combined, I believe, um, and with the easy availability of things, right? Uh, point of care ultrasounds, echo machines, right? And so many other tools that you have now, right? Um, it, it's a different ethical question, possibly, whether we are doing right or wrong. It's, I believe that is, uh, that is not part of the question. But, uh, you know, why it is relying is because, uh, you know, that we have been missing things. Right. In our day to day busy day to day practice, we have been, you know, uh, th there is a limitation to the inherent physical examination per se. So we have been missing quite a few findings. And now in this today's era of medical legal practice, I believe it has an important bearing on your clinical decision making as well. And, you know, we see so many and we hear so many cases, so many doctors being sued, their hospitals being broken, you know, because, uh, you know, we do miss things. And that is just a human trait. It is nothing that, you know, negative about it. But we do tend to miss uh, so many things on clinical examination. And so possibly, you know, with evolving trends, with evolving age, right, you know, we have been switching over. There is nothing bad in adopting technology, 
But yes, at the same time, you know, uh, technology cannot replace your uh, clinical practice or age-old practices of investigation. I mean, uh, you know, clinical practice as well. So it is just supplementing your clinical. So if it is available, right, with your clinical judgment, I think you can actually make a difference. You can actually make a positive difference. Now, you know, to the patient, overall patient management. And I believe that is the way to go. We, rather than looking at, you know, looking at what is positive, what is negative, we should actually combine the two positives and possibly go ahead. I think that should be the best answer to your question. Question, when do when will point of care ultrasound come to India? It's already here. We are using it not as frequently. We use it in coronary care unit. We use it in our cath lab. We do use it in our clinic, but the prevalent use will increase with uh, two things. One is relative reduction of price to more like one lakh rupee range or even less, which is close to a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. Butterfly IQ in America, uh, one of the least expensive is around two thousand dollars or less. And second thing will be people, including patients and everybody, accepting the psychology of time for stethoscope to go away. And that's hard. I still have a stethoscope hanging in my room. And thank God, because of the unfortunate COVID scenario, I stopped using it. But when did I stop using the stethoscope? Probably 10 years ago except in pulmonary related cases in my clinic uh, when patients had an excellent echocardiography done it's absolutely useless to put a stethoscope and come out with something you may claim is from your experience so i'm one of the doctors who truly believe time has come to leave stethoscope by the side except for general physicians Mainly for pulmonary findings, it's very easy, convenient. But if you can afford, I would recommend purchasing from Philips or GE. I'm not sure about Siemens having this point of care ultrasound. But you'll have to get a license to use it in your clinic uh, for non-maternity use. Uh, I think we can end here. Yeah, our session if there are no more questions. So I hope you all enjoyed this session and continue to attend the joint international conference program continuing on Doc Plexus, which has excellent uh, faculty from all across the world. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Vipul Kapoor, to be here. Thank, thank you, sir. You.